when the first thing we think when we think collective marking, people will think it lends itself better to languages and social studies, right? And less so in math and science. So there was a little bit of work to be done for Michelin to bring the math and science community to say, well, maybe there is such a thing as collective marking, and maybe it does work in any uh, in any situation. So it was pretty much built for social sciences and, and uh, for languages and then adapted. And we kind of made, we showed uh, other teachers for other subjects that it did work across the board. It across could uh, it could work for, for phys ed. It could work for anything at all. It's simply criteria based and it's competency based. And what you're doing is when you have a common understanding of what you're looking for, then you don't even have to mark together anymore because some people were saying yeah but i'm alone in my center yeah so um, you may very well be by yourself when you actually have to grade the papers or mark the exams or do the the, the marking so you there's a good chance that you won't be able to have a collective marking but the collective marking goes beyond the number of people you have in a room to the people understanding and using the rubrics or the tools the same way. So we simply make sure that people have the same tools, that they have the co common understanding of the tool itself, and also a common understanding of what the samples amount to. For example, what's a, what's a, what's a five? What's a four? What's a three? So we would come up with these samples and we would look at the samples together and come up with, okay, an understanding of the tool and an understanding of what consists in, you know, a three or four or five. And then you could leave, go to your community and be by yourself, but still have the reassurance that at the very heart of it, the understanding is the same. So you can pretty much trust that this, there will be a standardized or at least homogeneous evaluation done, even if it's done on your own. Yeah. I, because uh, the training was done together and you were able to, you know, to contribute your ideas, contribute your understanding, your interpretation, and come to a holistic or more organic understanding of the tool. And you were part of it. You are part of that conversation. It's not about me telling you this means this. But rather, what do you think it means? What does it look like to have achieved the competency in math or in science? or in, And it's not the same in any subject. And it's very subjective. So it's difficult to even have a common understanding. Well, imagine when you're by yourself, no one to actually... Uh, to to, co to compare whatever you have no one you're by yourself you have the tool in front of you and you do your best but a common understanding does definitely help mm -hmm. and reassures mm -hmm. you that in another community the same type of exam would be graded the same way so there's no um, inequalities in terms of wherever you are as a student you get the the fairest possible chance to have the most fair and equitable result for the same task. I want to say a standardized approach. It, yes. it, it would actually, yeah, it works. Um, that's why we try so hard to, uh, to bring it to our community and go, okay, so let's give this a try. And whatever the subject matter, we can definitely do something with that. So let me show you my screen. So um, last time when I was, uh, when I was, in, the intention was to show block one, the idea was to review program in DED and look at examination and breakdown of evaluation rubrics. Um, in this case, we did C2, C2 and C3 uh, because we wanted to look at English language arts so that's why it says c2 and c3 but depending on the subject of course it could be c1 c2 or c3 and the idea behind collective marking is that it's a process it's not something that you do just like that it's a process that you have to that you have to go through and again i was talking about the common understanding of the evaluation tool and then developing a common means of interpreting the work and then trying to put together collective marking sessions where we can, of course, when we have the manpower to do so. Uh, and if not, let's try to try maybe to look at it from a different angle 
uh, for our um, for our specialists in several different subjects like you are. So what I did for today, I prepared with three different uh, subjects in mind. So instead of just preparing English, I prepared English, I prepared contemporary world, and I prepared also English Sec 2, which is, uh, it's the CCBE English. Uh, it's not the same as uh, language arts. In this case, it's language of instruction, where they have different ways of approaching the tasks. So for a quick reference, if you wanted, you will you would be able to click. I will send you the link anyways, and you would have the whole um you'd have the whole document or the end of the document the marking correction guide where you'd have the rubrics okay so this one is for english i also prepared the contemporary world because again it might not be the same subject but if you look at it from that standpoint it's still rubric based it's still competency based and we're still looking at an interpretive uh, evaluation tool and if we go last to week, last week it was mentioned that uh the uh wording is going to is, is it is going to change for the science is that also the case for english we're hopeful that it might uh I they have done a lot of reworking of rubrics in the french uh okay. french second language we're keeping our fingers crossed for english um but we've heard that there would be a rehashing of some English exams and by the same token, probably a look at their rubric as well. So we're hopeful in that respect. And even if we look at a rub at an evaluation tool that is at the CCBE, which is, you know, a completely different ballgame, if we look at it, we still have several different types of rubrics. This is English Sec 2. Okay, 2102. And as you can see, there are many different rubrics, one for writing, and there's, you have one for reading and uh, non-interactive listening and so on. So it's, that's pretty much where everything started in the, as far as evaluation uh, with rubrics went. We also have in certain, uh, certain courses, writing check, in the case of English, we have writing checklists. This does not exist in uh, at the C at the DBE, which means Sec three four five, because they work only with rubrics. We work only with rubrics. But there's really no um, nothing prevents you from putting together your own checklist because the checklists, in my personal view, they are more student targeted then they should be more student targeted than teacher targeted in that a student should be able to have the checklist with them and process you know the process of the 10 weeks or the however many hours that they're working on a course they should have access to a, a checklist that would give them important information such as the evaluation criteria and what they what we're looking for uh, in that, and then they could be able to write wherever they stand on this, or um, do I feel comfortable? Do I need help here and there? So having a, a checklist here that would then give them also a little bit of an idea of what they're going to be asked to do once the exam comes around, because let's face it, an exam is a stressful, stressful um, experience for a lot of students. And as far as adult learners go, a lot of them have trauma, past trauma in terms of what they went through when they were in high school, for example. So we have to treat them with even more diligence. And I think those checklists can be uh, one way of achieving it. It's giving them, look, this is what we expect. This is what is uh, going to be the objective overall over the course of that 10 week or however many days you're at school for this particular course. And you get to keep track of how you're doing. And you can even use them formatively, having a sit down with your student every other week, for example, and looking at the checklist with them and evaluating what they do formatively with the rubrics even, just depending on what you teach, obviously. So we can have a whole list of different tools that are pretty much built the same way a rubric would be built. The idea is for students to have something 
right from the beginning. I'm a very, very strong believer in giving students the rubrics as early as possible so that they know what they're going to be evaluated with and about. And there's nothing wrong with providing students with the rubrics. The rubrics are, they're public, they're out there. You can't show them the exam, obviously. You should not teach to the exam in a perfect world. Of course, we have many, many things going on that might force us to change a little bit of our of our ways of doing, but we always try our best not to teach to the exam, to give them the best possible, uh, well-rounded, uh, you know, Get an education, of the not course. just the mark. Exactly. So it's about the experience. It's about what you what you take away from it. It's not just a grade. You're absolutely right. It's not just a mark. You're absolutely right. So as you can see, I I opened all four of them, and they are pretty much always the same type of tool. So imagine if a student sees this and goes, in math. I have a, a rubric. Teacher showed me the rubric. I know what I'm expected to do. I know what, what this is all about. And oh, this is not as stressful now that I am going to English because I know that for English, I also have the same type of evaluation tool. So overall, the student's going to be much better equipped to deal with the evaluation no matter what the subject is because they're going to be um, they're going to be knowledgeable about the tool. And then, of course, stress will be alleviated. Uh, and hopefully, if the, the teacher uses this throughout, then stress is very much going to be alleviated. That's my personal belief. So rubrics can be used and should be used in a formative and a summative setting. Okay, so a rubric does not just come out of an exam booklet at the end of a course and create an extremely high um, uh, amount of stress on, on a student. It should be pulled out as you begin the course and say, okay, we're going to look at the tools. The student's toolbox is not just their workbook and textbook, but it's also the assessment. Okay, because assessing means getting a comprehensive view of what the student can do but also what they have to keep working on. Uh, to assess is not to grade anymore. You assess by looking at as well-rounded a, a, a method as you possibly can so that you know, you know where your student is, okay? But they also know what they are good at and what they need to keep working on. So as an assessment tool, a rubric sets criteria for evaluation but in, it's evaluating performance, how they do, and not just what they scored, but how are you able to perform? How can you go through the process of, for example, solving an equation? How can you go through the process of writing the introduction to a personal letter? How can you uh, put together uh, a timetable or a timeline in history, for example? Or can you show how um, a, a world conflict will impact uh, the, the economy of that, of, of said country? Can you understand that? Can you go through the process? So evaluating their performance or the work completed, depending on where we are in the course of the weeks. A rubric can communicate. That's a very important word for me because it should speak to the teacher and to the learner. So it communicates the expectations, but also how we're going to assess and how we're going to make a decision on what you did. So that rubric that you present at the very beginning of the course, you're not just presenting it so that the student is familiar with it, but you are using it as you go. Sometimes you may use one criterion, sometimes two, sometimes the whole set of criteria, depending on uh, what you're evaluating, but the decision-making is done with the rubric. And it's easier to have a conversation with your student and say, look, this is where you stand as we are sitting right now, week three, for example, 
And this is what we're going to use week four, five, six. So you're, you have the, opp the opportunity to do better, better and better, but with the same set of criteria, with uh -huh. the same set of expectations. Uh -huh. So that there's no added stress as you go. You show them the real thing from the beginning and you say, and it's overwhelming when you start because it's, my God, will I be able to do all this? Yes, you will. But we're going to take it one step at a time. And we're going to pull that rubric as often as needed so that we can have a sit down and look at how you're doing right now, one-on-one -on -one, with that tool. And the student, hopefully, when you take it out and show it to them early, the students are even able to create student-friendly versions. And that's what we're probably, you looked at with Michelin, but we're going to look at again today together. So rubrics are both used for formative in process and summative, which is at the end of the course. And it's the same rubric should be used. No surprise. The only thing I would say you can do and you should do is remove the uh, the number the marks from the rubric that you use formatively. Simply because you don't want to create a stress with that has to do with, oh my God, this is the most important because it's the highest scoring criterion, for example. So a criterion that you have a 10 point value for and one you have a two or a five point value for that might create different expectations in your students. So what I do is I remove those numbers and I just use them later in the game so that it's really about what they can do what we are going to um, to observe, to look at, to be able to evaluate, but not about scoring, not from the beginning anyway. Especially when it's such a subjective course as language or social science. I mean, it's not about two plus two be equals four. Huh? It's about, can you tell me what the uh, what the purpose of this text is? Well, you can go from, Okay, not so, not too bad. You understand the basic, but then at the end of the course, you're really nailing that purpose. You understand what purpose is. And that's when uh, I think scores and grades and marks can be a little detrimental to students. So I remove them from the ones I use formatively. And the communication should be not between teachers only. At the very basis of it, a rubric should be a communication tool between a teacher and a learner. And yes, it should be a communication tool between learner with between teachers, between teacher and administration, between teacher and parents, if the parents are involved, but they should also be communication tools between students. They should be able to sit together with their rubric and make sense of it. And even in some cases, we do peer editing or peer evaluations. What do we use for peer evaluations? Rubrics. Yes. Checklists. And self-evaluation too, I guess. I, I would say the same. Yes, absolutely. And you could use the exact same rubric you're going to use when you evaluate their work. Ask them, where do you think you stand? Where do you think you are? And that's where I think it's important to create user-friendly rubrics with your students so that they have the same, same, same assessment tool, but put into language that is different, a little bit more uh, friendlier as far as users go. So when you use rubric with students, when they get familiar with the rubrics early on, they're more inclined to, uh, they are more inclined to have an engagement in their learning. They know from the beginning what they're going to be evaluated but they also know what's expected of them. Whoops. This engagement contributes to higher order thinking because they become critical thinkers about their work. They get to analyze where they are, uh, if they've made any progress, uh, if they are at a standstill and need to do maybe have another type of, of, um, of strategy, find other ways to uh, to work and you know get to their success, but they get to be critical thinkers and they get to analyze. Why is it that? How is it that? What did you do 
to to six to, to succeed for example at this particular thing what could you do to be more successful going over rubrics with students clarifies the expectations here's what i would like for you to be able to do and of course in the end here's what is expected of you at the end of the course itself depending on the number of hours and it really is irrelevant if it's a 50 hour course or a 100 uh, hour course doesn't really matter the idea is that the expectations are clearly communicated to the students and also the teacher can't change things around and although we're all super professional we know that there are teachers that are not so fair or that have a tendency to grade very subjectively whereas the rubric pretty much well it solves part of the problem because the communication between the two is done with the same tool in mind mm -hmm. student targeted rubrics make for an inclusive teaching practice so not only do they provide transparency in grading work they encourage full participation because students know ahead of time what they're going to be expected uh, to do. And they can have that that discussion is what why didn't you not that say, why did you not give me full marks on this here? Well, look, let's look at the rubric. Let's look at the criterion. Let's look at what the descriptor says. What do you think you could have done? So all of this breakdown of the tool really helps. Now, when we use it in a summative fashion, a summative way, then of course it's faster to assess because we're really looking at the organic aspect of evaluation. A criterion is much, much easier to uh, to observe or to look for a completion than a list of little different elements, for example. It's more fair, it's more objective because the references are the same for everybody. It's not about norm, it's about criterion. So did you meet the criteria? with uh, with um as opposed to how well did you do compared to others you can now compare yourself to you and it's really about that how did you do from day one to day 30. how did you go from this to this and they are they have to really ask themselves that question students are encouraged to be really at the center of their learning and isn't that what adult education is huh it's not about the teacher communicating but rather the adult learning so andragogy is really that's really how we look at things so formatively communication consistency transparency strength through observable descriptors and improvement now, of course, people could look at a rubric from the other standpoint and say, well, I can see your weaknesses, what you did not do, but I don't believe it should be done this way. I think we should look for the good always. So summative or formative. And the taxonomy, of course, we go from the bottom to the top. And as we go up, you are familiar with Bloom, then the higher thinking is and, and the, the critical thinker is at the Top. So those verbs are going to be the ones that you really want your students to, um, to develop and have and be able to handle. So if you look at a rubric, this is a rubric for uh, secondary five English, you see verbs such as develop, connect, organize. Uh, you have also analyze. Um, so all of those are from Bloom and the higher thinking order. So just to show you that they are, and it's the same for math and science, I'm sure. So how do we create a learning a learner targeted rubric? Well, this is my method. Okay, I used English Secondary 5, but it could be done with any other. And we can do it together if you want at another point. We could look at rubrics specific to what you're teaching and really do the exercise together if you want. So this is the actual rubric, okay, for competency to... And in this case, they're writing a critical essay. So we have the descriptors, the evaluation criterion. We have our descriptors right here. And look, there's a number in each box. I would remove the numbers so that there's nothing here and nothing at the bottom here either, because I don't want students to get to stumble upon those numbers. I want them to really 
uh, focus on what's asked of them. And this is way too complicated. Okay, it's even complicated for us sometimes, all the language and all that. So what I always do is we look at it from the teacher standpoint. So we have the, the evaluation criteria, we have the descriptors, and I always say, well, descriptors are meant to assess the degree of achievement. So however well you did, you should get a score with that. You should get a number attached to that. Now, strategy number one, this goes out as early as possible, first day if you can. And the strategy is with your learners, you go over the descriptors. And you go over this very complex if you have to, and you tell them, what are the words that are not clear? And there will be a lot of those. So you have to really be uh, ready to take the time to look at this with them. So you'll have a lot of words that are going to need clarification. And the outcome of this is to, it could take the form of a class generated list of synonyms for the targeted vocabulary, or they could edit directly on their paper. And, or you could even guide them and say, okay, so let's change this word and put a synonym, an, an easier term. And they can come up with their translation, if you will. What we're doing when we do this is we're not dumbing it down. We're simply removing what's unnecessary for them to be able to do the task. Okay? This is mech generated. This is, you know, the, the, the very complicated... Uh, edited 700 times types uh, of assessment tools. But who's to say that we need all this to understand what's really going to be evaluated? So this is something that I believe very, very, very strongly in, is that taking this rubric and making it user-friendly. Now, you could also say, okay, let's go and use a clean slate, completely blank slate, and let's just look at what the criteria, the list of criteria is. So in this case, if we take the first one, we see that there is going to be coherent construction of meaning from the text. Okay, so that's even complicated a bit, or complex anyways. And you make it a little easier by synthesizing. You're going to remove the unnecessary terms and you're going to tell them you will demonstrate your ability to analyze, interpret, and explain some of the literary elements. And again, I would remove the mark value right here. The idea here is that the descriptors are synthesized and they clarify the competency. So instead of a 30 word descriptor, we come up with a nine to 10 word synthesis of what's going to be done. Okay, what's going to be expected. Or you could do the same thing, use the exact same type of, of, of boxes, but work from I can statements. So instead of you will have to da da da. Okay, go from the I can. I can analyze, interpret, and explain. It says exactly the same thing. But from a first person point of view, sometimes it helps them take, um, they take ownership of what they're asked to do. And that ownership gives them more power over their learning. So that's possible, something that may be something that you uh, you would do with them. Now I'm interested. I'd like to know what other things you would do. What other ideas do you have for uh, something that would work a little better with your students, depending on the subject matter, of course. It could be uh, English, it could be history, it could be even math or science, I don't mind. We can talk about those as well. Do you have any other types of ideas to go about this? I don't have specific examples, but I have an attitude of approach in the sense of you try to find something they're already um, familiar with in a topic and engage okay. the conversation that way so that the, the introduction of the rubric would be less threatening by broaching a topic they know already 
mm-hmm. something out of their hobbies or something, and then make the segue over to social studies or ELA. Well, that's in this a good case. idea. Yeah. Okay. And would you then look at their what well, that for example that hobby or that that leisure activity or what they what they do that's different for now? Would you present it with a, a set of criteria, for example? Oh, I would actually ask them to uh, describe the criteria, what constitutes, for example, a mediocre approach to, um, let's say, in the case of one of the student, uh, the hobby is crochet. Mm-hmm. They want to do uh, some knitting and things. So what constitutes a good job? What constitutes a perfect job? And uh, how would you how would you mark? Do you believe evaluation is even necessary for that? And then make the make the carryover into the academic world to uh, generate a conversation around well how do you think we should approach your um, work in this English language study or in this uh, social studies or hey. again the math or the science so you place them in the position of the evaluator yes okay. for, for a point of view for a point of view to discussion yes mm-hmm. Yes. And that makes a lot of sense. It's it's as if you say, for example, you watch a dance show and you're sitting on the couch with whomever and you go, this is bad. <laughs> what makes it bad? Well, exactly. the movement's repetitive or the, there's no, but that's the idea. You find, you you extract criteria. And then like, from hopefully, what you know. hopefully that would take out the threatening piece of, the need to have an evaluation mm-hmm. in something that they're they're uh, working towards, yeah. That's and interesting. To, to accentuate the to accentuate the progress rather than perfection. I mean, you can you don't start out as an expert in anything. No. But as you grow in the progress, uh, right now we're here. We're in review mode. Mm-hmm. So so. Um, some people are just about ready to start an actual uh, SOFAD course. Right. But uh, we've been, like some of them have late late registered as well. Mm-hmm. So And others have been away. So there's this um, approach to allowing the software to evaluate them and give the feedback or retroaction, as you say in French. Mm-hmm. And uh, from, from there, we... We plan to get into the courses, uh, and I, I purposely bought a bit of time for myself by wanting to attend these sessions and reading up on the SOFAD materials, etc. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to get to the point where, okay, here's how we plan to do the evaluation once we get to it, mm-hmm. and to describe the necessary parts of. Well, you don't just come in and pay for your tuition and by a mark, it's, uh, it's a process, right? Right. Yeah. And that's how you then determine if they're ready to begin. Correct. That SOFAD course. So do you, can you see this, this idea of rubrics and, and checklists working out with those students? Every single one of them. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because then they start wherever they're ready right. and they have, a, they have their own set of of uh of of strengths i mean they have their set of okay so this i can do and look where i need to put in more work and so on and so you can you can then lo- use the rubric or the checklist every single time you have a sit down with them to see where they are and to show them that they have increased they've progressed and they've done better and that there's you know the, and that there's still time and room for them to keep going and not that that things are not just said and done from the beginning and saying, I was never good at reading, for example, or I was never good at writing. And that may be past trauma. May, maybe someone in their schooling told them that they were never going to be able to read or write um, or add or subtract for that matter. And I hear what you're saying there. And uh, uh, the software that I was shown with IXL is a really good uh, a program to discover the gaps in the learning. Right. And once those gaps can be uncovered, then we can uh, kind of pinpoint where to focus. Mm-hmm. And it's not just me who does the focus. It's not like it's coming down <laughs> to me. It's a, it's a conversation. Exactly. Yeah. 
And you can even let them decide what gaps are should be prioritized. Yes. Where the gaps are mostly going to be detrimental to them. Because sometimes one gap in one subject will impact other subjects as well. I understand this. In the and this is something that they, problem. with experience, they are probably aware of this as we speak. Because they are coming back to school with some gaps, but also a life experience. Exactly. And they and know again, where the gaps were most detrimental to them. So we want to find the uh, way to activate the prior knowledge as much as mm -hmm. possible. Yeah. And make them critical thinkers about what really is the most important thing they must do. Mm -hmm. Is it about the grade? Is it about the, the score at the end? Is it about the 80 or the 65? No, it's about what you're going to do with that. And if you get out of this particular process, a better learner, because you know yourself better, then you're already a winner. Because think, you know I how you what learn. what you're describing there is, uh, I have this uh, expression called learning how to learn. Absolutely. And I think that's where the teacher comes in with, you know, that conversation based interaction where you're not just the grader anymore and you're not just the teacher teaching down, you know, on them, but rather you know, let's have a sit down. Let's, let's talk. Let's talk about what's going on. Let's talk about what's difficult. Let's talk about what's easier. Let's talk about what your success is because they haven't some always. Some of them are open to that and some are not. Right. And here in the pre uh, board, there's also this other piece that uh, factors into it. So there's this uh, there's this lady who gives counseling as well. So what you were saying about the trauma and things, um, we we've got mm -hmm. uh, we we've got a lady on uh, on call Tuesday, wow. Wednesday, and Thursday, and they can uh, they can call up and make an appointment. And Without I like her email. To make it very much of an advance appointment. Yeah. And I like the uh, email address chat today. Yes. Chat. Let's yes. have a talk. So there's there's another piece of uh, um, a tool in the progress. Absolutely. That, that they can uh, take advantage of. And I've, uh, we were told to pass it around, and uh, I did. And one of our students is regularly accessing that. Wow. And the others good. know about it. So mm -hmm. I guess it's up to them as adults what they choose to do with that info. But there's a good chance they're going to talk about it or at least hear about it and go, mm, maybe. And they might not say it, but they might be tempted to uh, to take to, you know give it a look or make an appointment and see what that's all about because they hear about it because, you know, and that, again, is part of the conversation that you may have later down the line or not. They may be very quiet about it, but maybe they're going to go and, and take advantage of that extra help. I, I want to say that uh, some years ago, I was up, like uh, way up north and uh, uh, I, I I had uh, some time in an adult uh, teaching situation up there as well, mm -hmm. and I used a very mechanical way of uh, using the multiplication tables to teach mm -hmm. long division by moving okay. the m moving the place value back and forth with a piece of paper to okay. uh, to follow the the multiplication table mm -hmm. and. Uh, I met this guy on the street some uh, some years later, and he said, "You know, Angelo, I'm in my 40s now." And he said that that way you showed me division. Now I understand those little inches, uh, pieces of an inch on the uh, on a carpenter's measurement uh, thing, there you know, you the go. ruler. Mm -hmm. And he by doing by learning that mechanical way, he couldn't get it abstractly, but the hands-on part. He took the time, we took the time, and by practicing and drill, he got it, and he made the links to his job as yep. a carpenter's helper. And, uh, you know, the the smile in his eyes really showed that it opened up something that, you know, is a small thing, but it's a big thing. 
but it's huge. It's learning yeah. to learn. Yeah, learning to yeah. learn. You said it. Yeah. You know what? We're running out of time. I will see you soon. And if you need any any help, don't hesitate. Okay, reach out to us. So let's talk later. Thank you very much for being here, Angelo. 